Now, um, I don't know, maybe I need to introduce myself. I'm Jerry Thomas, and I'm one of the elders of the church. Pastor Eric is on sabbatical this week and has asked me to fill in for him. And it's a joy, it's exciting for me to be here and share God's word with you. And um, what I'm going to do is share what the Lord has been placing in my heart. And uh, he's just been dropping little tidbits in my heart for the last few weeks. And I, I want you to understand that what I'm sharing today is not a continuation of the Lord's uh, five-week series on the Holy Spirit, but being here for that five-week series for the Holy Spirit is hard to get away from that subject. It's hard to get away from the power of God, from the feeling of God, from the very presence of God. So I'm going to refer you to the book of John and looking at especially chapters 14, 16, and 17, because these are the chapters that Jesus shared a teaching and uh, some conversation with his disciples. And it was really the last teaching that he had shared before he was betrayed and crucified. Now, when I was a kid, my mom would always do her shopping on Saturday morning. She'd get us up, my three sisters and I, and she would give us instructions. My sisters had to clean the house, wash the dishes, make the beds, things like that inside the house. I had to get out in the yard, cut the grass, weed the flower garden. And these were the last words that she spoke to us before she walked out of the house. Now, if we didn't get that done before she got back, we were in trouble. So I want you to understand that the last words that someone speaks to you before they leave are very important. All right? Now these, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of the book of John, are the last words of Jesus before he was betrayed and crucified. So it is very important for us to understand these chapters. Now, I'm not going to read all the chapters to you, but I am going to share some of each one of them for you this morning. I want you to first look in chapter uh, 17. So we're going to start at 17 and, and work our way back. Look at John 17 and look at verses 9 through 19. Jesus prays for his disciples here. John 17, verses 9 through 19. This is where, and, and, and look at verse 9. He says, I pray for them. He's praying for them, that is, his disciples. He's praying to God for his disciples. Say, I, I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours and are all mine, all, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. What Jesus is saying here is that Jesus Christ is one with the Father, and Jesus Christ has become one with his disciples, and he's praying for them. And he prays for them all the way down to verse 20, and then he does something unique that should catch your attention. Because in, in verse 20 of John 17, Jesus says, I do not pray for, for these alone, but also, also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So what Jesus is saying here, he's not just praying for his disciples, those 12 or, or, or those uh, the, that are following him there uh, around Israel. He's not just praying for them. He is praying for them, but he's not just praying for them. Jesus has the ability to look forward to this day. This day. And to look forward to see who is in this 
congregation today and pray for you. Look at verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I have believed and you have believed in Jesus Christ through the testimony of the disciples of Jesus that were with him before he died. So therefore, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. And he's not just, just praying that, that we would uh, get saved. He's praying that we would be one with him. That we would be one with him. Now, you, you need to understand that this is, this is a unique thing in the world that the rest of the world does not have this relationship we have a unique relationship here. Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, has prayed for us and is saying that he wants us to be one with him and the Father. And there's a way to do that. Uh, why would Jesus, why would Jesus pray for us unless he wanted to continue the work that he had started there on earth? So he's praying for us that we might continue to work. Now, I want you to look back at chapter 16. Flip, flip back one, one chapter. Look at chapter 16. Look at verse 7. And uh, I thought this was, this was very interesting that Jesus is continuing the teaching. And, and if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, you will see all these uh, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, they're all written in red. Uh, they're, they're all the words of Jesus. So Jesus says in chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It is to our advantage, it is to your advantage and my advantage that Jesus goes away because without him going away, we cannot receive the helper. And the helper is identified as the Holy Spirit, the paraclete that walks with us, that walks beside us and behind us and, and, and it actually fills us up. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. So Jesus uh, tells us that it's to, it's to our advantage to go away so that the, the helper, that is the Holy Spirit, can come and help us. What's he going to help us to do? Well, to get saved, sure. He's going to help us. He's going to draw us so that we might be saved. But we're, we're talking about the works of Christ here. We're talking about Jesus calling us, saving us, being one with us so that we can do the works of God. Not just to get saved and wait for the rapture, not just to get saved and wait until we die, but that we might be able to do the works of God. So the helper can come and help us to do the work of God. Now go back uh, to chapter 14. Chapter 14, look at verse 10. John 14, 10, do you not believe that I, I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the works of God. He's talking about the manifestations that people are seeing as he ministers on earth. He's talking about the works of God. So here we have the works of God. As we were singing this, these songs this morning, and, and uh, Pastor Wes and I were talking earlier in the week, and he was he was asking me, what songs do you want, to, you want me to, to, to sing this week? I said, listen, just listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you to match up exactly with what I'm sharing on Sunday morning. 
And uh, they started singing that song, We Echo His Authority. We echo his authority. We echo his authority. Listen, this is the works of Christ. This is the works of God. This is what God wants us to understand. We are echoing his authority through the works of the Holy Spirit, through the works of God. Not only does Jesus do the works of God, but so do you. So do I. We do the works of God. Uh, we are the ones Jesus prayed for in John 17, 20, when he said, not only do I pray for my disciples that are here, but I also pray for them. That's you and me. He's also praying for us. Now we are one with the Father and with Jesus because of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives within us. The Holy Spirit will work through us the works of Christ. Look at verse 25 and 26 in chapter 14. 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, and then he, he, he clarifies what he's saying there. But the helper, that is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to rem you remembrance all things that I have said. So we are one with God, one with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are his. He is ours. And the works that he started on earth when he was here, he expected and expects today to continue to be worked in society. He expects those works to carry on. What are some of the examples of the works of Christ. If you'll, if you'll study your Bible, you'll find out there's 37 to 40 different miracles that are recorded in the gospel. These are the works of God that Jesus Christ was doing as he was ministering uh, on earth before his death. Uh, his first miracle was turning uh, water into wine. Uh, then... He heals an official son. Uh, then he casts out demons. Then he heals many that are blind, that are deaf, that are mute, that are sick, that are diseased. Uh, he even raised the dead. Uh, he, he, he feeds thousands with one lunch. Uh, these are things that Jesus, these are the works of God that Jesus was doing. And Jesus didn't go out of his way in order to do these works. As he went on his way, he did the works of God. Where he was walking through the countryside, he would see somebody that needed his help and perform the works of God in their life. Either healing them or casting out a demon. Uh, he, he even walked on water. He quieted the storm. All these things are God working on earth. And God didn't stop working on earth when Jesus died on the cross and ascended into heaven. Jesus gave his power to the church. And these are just some of the examples of the things that Jesus did. And these are just some of the examples that Jesus expects his church to do today. Sure is quiet in here. These are the works God wants, Christ wants you and I to do. Um, now, the rest of the New Testament, Acts through Revelation, is just a testimony of John 14 through 17. It's just a testimony of what Jesus told his church, told his disciples. So starting in the book of Acts, working all the way through the book of Revelation, is just examples of the works of God. In Acts chapter 1 and 2, just before Jesus ascended, he told, turn there, Acts chapter 1, 
It's just a few pages. Acts chapter 1. In verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, this is after Jesus' resurrection from the grave, just before he ascended to be with the Father. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. Now, listen to that. He commanded them. He's not just suggesting that we do these things. He is commanding his disciples. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What's the promise of the Father? We found that out in John 14 through 17. The Helper is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. You heard from me in chapters 14 through 17 in John. For John truly baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And by the way, he encouraged them to stay there in Jerusalem. Uh, the disciples with a, a group of 120 or so stayed there uh, in, in an upper room and they prayed continually for about 10 days after Jesus ascended. And then he said to them, just before he ascended up into the clouds, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now this is, what, this is the very last thing Jesus said to his church before he ascended into heaven. The very last thing. And as I said earlier, the very last thing that somebody says to you is important. It's very important. So it's important that we understand this. So the disciples did what he said. They stayed there in Jerusalem. They continued to pray. And in 10 days, on the day of Pentecost, when people from all over the world, Jews from all over the world, had descended on Jerusalem, people of every language, of every tribe, of every culture were there, uh, and, and they were there for uh, the, the festival of Pentecost. And while they were there, it says they were all filled with the hope, the, the disciples were all filled with the, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want you to notice the, the way the scripture is written here, they began, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, what does that mean? They began to speak with other tongues. They began to speak in other languages. Now, why would, why would they begin to speak in other languages? Because these were all Galileans that only knew, only knew their own language. They didn't know the language of the Cretes. They didn't know the, the language of, of the Ethiopians. They didn't know the language of all these other people around the world. But they began to speak in another tongue or another language. Why? The Lord had instructed them, be filled with the Holy Spirit and his power so that you can do the works of God. As they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began speaking in other tongues, other languages, so that every person that was there could hear the gospel story of Jesus Christ. Every person from every country that uh, all over the world, all over the known world at that time that were there, they were preaching in their tongue in their language so that they may hear the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they could come to know Jesus as their savior too. That's the reason for the manifestation. That's the reason for the works of God to carry on in the church today. It is very important. Let me give you an example of, of this very thing. On one of my trips to Israel, one of the ladies in our, two, our tour group uh, an American lady that only spoke English. Uh, we had visited the Welling Wall 
that afternoon and we had free time that evening. So some of us went shopping, some of us went here or there. This one lady went to the welling wall, or the praying wall, uh, where that was divided. Uh, about a third of it was for the women, two thirds were for the men. And it was at night. She went and there weren't very many people there. Uh, and she went up to the wall and she started praying. Well, she was spirit filled and she started praying in tongues. She positioned herself away from everybody else. There was nobody around her when she started praying, but she started praying in tongues. And as she was praying, somebody else, another lady, came up and stood near her close enough to hear her praying in tongues. Now, the lady that was a part of our tour, tour group had no idea. She had her eyes closed. The lady was quiet. She just continued to pray. And finally, the lady that had walked up said, who is this Jesus you're talking about? Who is this Jesus you're praying to? And come to find out, this lady that had just walked up was a recent uh, immigrant from Russia that could speak very um, fluent Russian, just a little bit of English, but very fluent Russian. And when she asked the lady, who is this Jesus you're talking about? She asked her in Russian, who is this Jesus you're talking about? And the lady said, I, I don't speak your language. I don't understand. And she understood that she was English. So she, in her broken English, she said, you were praying about this Jesus. Who is this Jesus that you were praying for? And the the lady in the tour group had no idea that she was praying in Russian. But the lady, the immigrant from Russia, says, you were speaking fluent Russian, and I understood you to say, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Tell me about this Jesus. So why do we do the works of God? Why are we filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? What is God wanting us to do? He wants us to continue to do his work. Now, the lady from the tour group, she was obedient enough to be used of the Holy Spirit and of God to do the works of God. She shared the rest of the gospel story with this woman from Russia. She got saved that night and testified at our gathering the following night. And we all praise God for that. Now, why are there tongues, other tongues uh, that's mentioned in the Bible? This is a good example of that. Listen, it, it, all these things, all these works of Christ that he did, he said, not only will you do them, but you will do even greater than them. And as I look down through the ages, I mean, there, there have been millions of people saved. Uh, Jesus saw thousands. We have seen millions since his ascension. We have seen millions of people healed. We have seen millions of people come to know Jesus Christ. All this is happening because the works of Christ are still in effect today. The power of the Holy Spirit is still alive and well in the church today. All we need to do is do as these songs said that we sang this morning. I want more. I want more. I want more of the Holy Spirit so that I can do the works of God. Now, God wants to do his work. The only way he does it is through the church. The only way he can do it through the church is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not me. It's not you. This lady in the tour group, she wasn't a theologian. She wasn't a pastor's wife. She wasn't uh, learned in the Bible. All she was was a Christian. We have Christians in our children's church, in our youth group. We have Christians sitting here this morning. 
That's all God is asking for, for you to trust in him, be filled with his power so that you can continue the work of Christ here on earth today. Are you ready to do that? Amen. Let's do it.